and we're going to get started on the next panel, uh, which is sadly the last panel of GAP Summit. So we have with us here today Daniel Meyer, one of the panelists who is the pre president of Cyber Spiber US subsidiaries. We have Dr. Austin Shea, who is the co-founder of Ginkgo Bioworks. We have McKinley Smith, who is the senior director of strategy and planning at Checkerspot. And then we have Dr. Darshil Yusha, who is the assistant professor in material science and design here at the University of Cambridge. And they all are going to be chaired by the lovely Christian Mertens, the founder and CEO of Do Goodery. So without further ado, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi, guys. Very exciting. Well, I feel very honored that we get to round this event out as the last panel and once again after lunch so I hope we can keep your attention for the next hour. Um, before we jump in, I don't know if this has happened yet this morning but I just want to give an incredible shout out to the organizing team for an amazing dinner last night. Like that was so cool. So cool. And I also want to recognize all of you. I have had the great fortune of meeting many of you in the last 48 hours and I will say like, you know, it's hard sometimes to feel hopeful about our future given so many things that are happening among, um, around the world. And all of you are just incredible humans. And not only are you brilliant and PhDs, but your level of emotional intelligence just blows my mind. So, and kindness, like everyone has been so kind. So not to cheese out, but one more time, a round of applause for everybody here. Awesome, awesome. So. I'm feeling darn good about the future, so today is an excellent panel to talk about resources of the future with a really interesting group of people. We have two scientists and two non-scientists, which I think is fantastic because without science, we don't have anything cool, and without those bringing the science to market, we don't have the science. So with no further ado, um, I'm gonna let these guys introduce themselves, and we're gonna do a very similar format to yesterday. We're not gonna toss around questions. We are gonna invite you to ask us questions from the beginning because who wants to hear our boring questions? So anyway, so Dr. Darshil, why don't you get us started? Sure, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm Darshil, um, I'm an associate professor in the department uh, at, in architecture at the University of Cambridge. Um, I started off studying engineering and mathematics at Nottingham about 15 years ago and then uh, did a PhD in the field of composite materials, looking at plastics, uh, but alternatives to conventional plastics uh, in the wind turbine sector, particularly as replacements to conventional uh, wind turbine blade materials. Um, and then I joined the Oxford Silk Group uh, several years ago, looking at spider silk and uh, elephant ivory and these beautiful natural materials and structures and synthesizing or at least looking at using these as alternatives to conventional materials for the aerospace and the defense sectors. And then for the past seven years, I've been working at the Center for Natural Material Innovation here, looking at bio-based materials as alternatives to conventional anthropogenic materials. One of the statistics that always comes to mind is that at present, anthropogenic mass, the amount of human-based materials we have produced uh, over the past several centuries exceeds living biomass on the planet. So we've been producing a lot of stuff. Most of it is concrete, uh, aggregates, brick, for example, and we need to be using more renewable materials. So that's where our focus is. It's so mind-blowing. This guy is super cool. I mean, they're all super cool. So thank you, Darshiel. <laughs> um, next, we have a fabulous fellow Californian slash Oregonian uh, who flew all the way from the West Coast to join us. Uh, McKinley's the newest member of our panel, and I know that you will find her to be absolutely fantastic. So, McKinley. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I'm McKinley Smith, and I'm the Senior Director of Planning and Strategy for a company called Checker Spot as of four weeks ago. And um, our focus is using microalgae to create commercial grade oils in consumer products. So we have both B2B um, application as well as consumer goods. And um, I am controversially, I dropped out of my graduate program at London School of Economics to help start a company in San Francisco. So my background, I've, I've taken two startups from zero to post Series A, um, and then I've worked at Roche and Genentech 
and capacities of strategy, chief of staff, um, and support in commercial and product development. And um, prior to that, I worked in politics and um, Chinese business. So I've lived many lives, but I've spent the last seven, eight, we don't need to <laughs> know, years in biotech and planning to stick it out for the rest of my career. It's a wonderful place to be. Thank you. See, told you, she's pretty cool. <laughs> All right, now, I mean, it just, the coolness keeps going. So next we have Dr. Austin. I know you guys have last names, but I love saying Dr. slash first. It's <laughs> much more fun. Cool, yeah, um, so I'm Austin. Um, I'm very fascinated by the group here. You know, I have a very similar background to many of you. Um, PhD and started at Ginkgo Bioworks right out of PhD, a group of four of us, five plus my advisor, five of us. Sounds a lot like some of the, the competition groups that you guys have, you know, like a couple of people coming up with ideas, starting companies. So um, best of luck for all, all of you and, and, and your entrepreneurship journey. And so at Ginkgo, you know, our view of biology is maybe a little bit different from a lot of what this, you know, a lot of the other panelists and, and what we've been talking about is, you know, a lot less focus on, I think, the, you know, the future on like human health and food and what people traditionally think of as biology. Like what our vision at Ginkgo is that everything should be in the future grown. Like the, like biology is a tool for programming matter. Like everything physical should be affected by biology. Like you look around you, like the furniture, your phones, this room, the building. Like what if everything was built with biology and, and how can we enable that? And so that's, that's what we're excited about at Ginkgo is sort of like building that tool set to uh, make that happen. I have so many questions for Austin, but that'll be for later. Um, all right, and last, another person joining us from the US, from Midwest US, Mr. Daniel, please introduce yourself. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Daniel Meyer and I am president of uh, Spiber America and Spiber is a uh, Japanese startup company and as you just heard, Checker Spot is using fermentation to make oils while Spiber uses fermentation to make protein materials, uh, primarily apparel, you know, fibers for textiles or uh, protein fibers for use in automotive composite materials and so on and so forth. And we actually got our start in spider silk. Um, so, you know, Darcy will mention that as well. Um, spider silk is obviously a, a very, uh, you know, it's long been kind of the holy grail of the material scientist. It's the toughest known fiber that's out there. Uh, so that is kind of the first protein that we chose to use our platform to design and produce. Uh, so again, Japanese company uh, back in, I, I was in Japan for uh, about, 11 years uh, after I did a degree in international business. So I am one of the non-scientists on the panel, uh, unfortunately. Uh, fortunately, I don't I know. know. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, and so after our, uh, university, I moved to Japan. I was there for about 11 years, and uh, I am the head of global corporate strategy uh, at Spiper Inc. in Japan. And recently, we partnered with uh, Archer Daniels Midland, or ADM, one of the biggest grain processors in the US. And we are building our second um, protein fermentation facility uh, next, right next to the ADM corn mill uh, in Iowa. So um, I've kind of been a lot all over the place in Spiber throughout my career. Um, you know, at one time I was literally down in the lab uh, using, uh, pressing protein polymer into like protein plastic discs that we would then, you know, test their material properties um, to, you know, <clears throat> lots of strategic partnerships with uh, academia uh, to lots and lots and lots of fundraising. Uh, that's definitely and unfortunately, I would probably say, but necessary. Um, and uh, now today, I, I've moved to Iowa to uh, help with our big capital you know, fermentation plant construction project. So these days, my uh, foc focus and my passion is more on industrial biotech, mechanical engineering type um, problems like Okay, fermentation is really awesome, but what do we do after that? You know, what is our downstream process? What do we do with the waste that comes out of that? Um, how do we uh, optimize this large-scale uh, facility to minimize the uh, environmental impact? Those are the kind of things that are on my mind uh, these days. So, yeah, thank you. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you. A round of applause for our panelists, please. So as you've heard, we have a really interesting mix of people who are all thinking about a sustainable future, the circular economy, but many of them are coming from an entrepreneurial perspective, fundraising, research, science, and you have them all here. So 
If you guys are ready to start asking questions, do you want to do this? Yeah? Ooh, OK. Well, someone take a risk. Go first. Well, hello, sir. Do we have a mic runner? Absolutely. Uh, hello, my name is Ryan. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Uh, and this is kind of inspired by um, uh, Daniel talking about your start being in Iowa, which obviously a big agriculture region, region for fermentation, but isn't traditionally thought of as a biotech hub. So considering this resources of the future and looking towards kind of broadening the access of biotech and bioentrepreneurship, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on kind of how we can break into expanding biotech beyond the traditional hubs of, you know, London, UK, uh, Boston, San Francisco. Great. That's an excellent question for Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Um, well, I would say that we were just talking about this at lunch, actually, and I, I think I said, you can start your company on the coasts, but everyone doing fermentation eventually ends up where the corn is or where the, the feedstock is. Um, I'd say definitely right now, Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, uh, the Corn Belt in the US is seeing more and more companies actually getting their start there, um, spinning out of the universities there and reaping the benefits of being kind of right there where the feedstock is um, to, to even start their company. And, um, now, you know, with more and more people working remotely um, online since the pandemic, I think it's it's becoming more. It's 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 go, we're going to see things shift um, more to going where the feedstock is, and also just generally being more not all, everyone being in one place. Um, the one other thing I will mention uh, that I think a lot about these days uh, in terms of a fermentation. Uh, you know, a company that is using fermentation as its manufacturing uh, method to make a product. Um, <coughs> Spiber is currently, um, we have our life cycle analysis for our product and it's being compared to some of the incumbent fibers that we're hoping to replace such as cashmere or wool. Um, and that is under uh, third party critical review right now. We're going to be publishing the results here by the end of the year. but. Um, what we have found and what we kind of already knew before we did this process is the, the single largest contributor to the environmental impact of a product being made through fermentation is definitely that feedstock. And corn is, um, you know, leaves some things to be desired <laughs> um, in terms of its uh, environmental impact. I mean, it's definitely renewable um, and it's definitely better than some things, but it still has its issues. And so uh, even looking further into the future, I think we're we're going to see more and more efforts on alternative feedstocks, and that may in turn affect uh, where the, the locations that you see people starting to uh, do these activities in. Yeah. Yeah, if I can extend what Daniel has been saying about alternative feedstocks, uh, I think that's quite important. For example, uh, with the built environment sector, um, there are lots of countries that are not timber producing. England only has 13% of its land area covered by forests. So it's one of the second biggest net importer of timber in the world, but it still uses quite a lot of it for the construction sector. What hasn't happened is thinking around what happens to timber when a building is deconstructed. And we have been looking at this concept of an urban forest in which if you have future cities with this uh, material that is stored and then just de without or demolished and then not separated, um, how can you actually design future buildings better or cities better so that you can extract the resources for future reuse? Uh, and that's where the circularity aspect comes in because then you need to think about where exactly the resource needs to go in. Should I be using a virgin material or resource for this application or should I be going to the waste market or uh, some other alternative feedstock for uh, the resource? Thank you for your question. Who's next? The gentleman in the blue button down. Hi, uh, thank you. I'm Miles. I'm a computational chemist at AstraZeneca. And I'm having a great day because I think I've asked a question in every single panel so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a, a great conversation this morning about the use of data 
Uh, but in order to store data, we have to use massive data centers, uh, which require a lot of energy and, and can take up quite a lot of space. Uh, there's also the issue that 95% of microchips are manufactured in China and Taiwan, which creates a slight risk uh, relating to the, the geopolitical situation there. So my question is, how are we going to be able to build and resource these data centers to store of our data in a sustainable and efficient way moving forward? I'm not going to do the thing and call on somebody. I could talk to the energy side a little bit, if, but if someone has something on. I, I just have one point um, on, that, on that topic that's come up a few times, which is I think we have to think about the intentionality of what we're storing more, more than we are right now, because I think there's obviously a huge and understandable emphasis on, on the footprint. Um, but I think there's something, something to consider about is the entire life cycle and, and what and why. Obviously, for regulatory purposes, there's, there are requirements in terms of what we're storing and why we're storing it. But somebody who has spent many years in a very large behemoth of a company, the amount of operational and technical debt that's being stored and carried over is momentous. And so as we're looking at it from a sustainability perspective, operational sustainability is a huge component of this issue that we are not necessarily addressing across the board today. And again, adding to Kimberly's <laughs> point, um, you mentioned life cycle. Um, mm -hmm. In the area of building construction, uh, we've been talking about operational carbon and operational emissions for the past decade or so. Uh, and therefore uh, improving where the energy is coming from for heating or cooling buildings. Uh, data centers cooling is really important. So uh, looking at renewable, I think you can talk about that a bit more. But the other side of the coin is looking at embodied emissions. And that has not been really considered in much detail, particularly by architects and structural engineers, because 50% or between 30 to 50% of emissions in the construction use life cycle of a building are actually up front. The emissions are already made when the building is constructed and therefore constructing with natural materials like timber or bio-based materials is one important strategy to reducing the carbon footprint of whatever structures we are building. But if you wanted to talk about the energy side. Yeah, I was just going to say, again, um, fresh off of a meeting, I think, last Friday, where I reviewed the latest kind of LCA results, um, the, the second largest um, contributor to the environmental impact of fermented materials, uh, second to the feedstock, is definitely electricity use. And I think it's because we are, well, we're doing a lot of cooling. You're, you've got a fermenter, you've got microorganisms producing heat, but you've got to keep it at room temperature. So in that sense, it's a little bit similar to a data center because we're having to spend a lot of energy to keep that cool. Um, and then that electricity use is driving our environmental impact. <clears throat> and um, one thing that's important is changing the uh, policies, changing the infrastructure in the world so that uh, companies have better access to more renewable electricity um, in Iowa we are forced to only use one uh, electric utility. And uh, thankfully, they're one of the best in the US. I think they're 40% uh, renewable, um, which is one of the better states in the US. But we can't really choose, uh, unless we want to build our own huge um, power plant next to our facility, um, <coughs> you don't really have a, a choice. Um, and so kind of changing the rules of the game so that there are more options for people out there um, or uh, more uh, education or more uh, acceptance around um, like virtual power purchase schemes um, or you know, there's a lot of, I think, um, there's a lot of BS out there, I think, also when it comes to these kind of uh, carbon credits and whatnot and, and trying to differentiate between what is actually meaningful and what isn't meaningful. Um, it's tough for uh, a startup to be able to become educated enough to um, make, make sure they're making all the right decisions, uh, even if they are good intentioned. So um, that is uh, an important aspect. And then the last thing I'll say is 
even if you do get your electricity 100% renewable, this is something that I've been seeing since I've been looking at our LCA results. We have two kind of LCAs that we're looking at. One is assumes that we are only using the grid electricity. The other one assumes we have offset that use by having a renewable energy that we are investing in in another location. And the basis for that currently is solar panels. Um, and obviously, some things get a lot better about our LCA. Uh, our carbon emissions get a lot better. Um, but some things get a lot worse, like ecotoxicity gets a lot worse because of the materials that are being used to make the solar panels. So, um, you know, just saying, oh, renewable, um, you're good to go, uh, isn't necessarily the case as well. So there's definitely gaps um, there left to be uh, looked at. Thanks, Daniel. I'm going to take a pause from the audience really quickly because we've talked a lot about materials. Austin. You guys work on materials, but there's also a human side of this. All I think about is Dolly the lamb and the clone of Dolly the lamb. So can you talk a little bit about this idea of bioengineering human life and what that means and, and how it scares me um, and also the incredible opportunity for it as well? So to be clear, we're not engineering humans yet. No, uh, yeah, see, you just said yeah. Just want to point that out. <laughs> and, and it's not clear, clear if and when we would want to do that. There, there's, there's a question of, like, if we could, is it, you know, like, do we as a society, like, if, if someone wants to grow a tail or, you know, like, <laughs> wants to, you know, augment them themselves with biology, you know, will, will we let them? So, so I guess the, your question is, is sort of, like, how do we deal with the... Um, the social issues that come with uh, biology as being such a, like, a powerful technology. And I, I would say the, the, this is a very complicated question and, and, and like, there's no answers that we can um, provide uh, for the world. Um, but I think our approach at Ginkgo is, is, is probably the opposite of like, how tech companies take it, right? Like, if, you know, like YouTube or Facebook, you know, their approach is like, we can't, we can't control what people post. You know, it's a, it's, um, there, there, it's just a platform, general, you know, available for anyone. If you want to post, you know, stuff that that that's offensive or what have you, we can't moderate it. We think that biology is too powerful for us to basically be like a platform like that. That we actually have to care about like what is how our technology is being used, and so we need to make that decisions as sort of like the gatekeepers of this, of like is where where is the line, right? Like what is it that we will um, projects that we'll do and what we will not, um, and so. Right now, you know, the current instantiation, you know, we have employee voted, you know, the employees at Ginkgo um, uh, basically uh, vote for a, what we call a caring committee, which, which um, decides on projects that we take on or not. And, and so, you know, our view is that we have humans that are deciding on, on things that will affect other humans, the world. And hopefully, you know, that's, that's our current mechanism is not perfect for sure. Um, um, and we're always also engaging with sort of like governments and um, the general public, you know, we have, we've, from the very beginning of Ginkgo, we've, we've, we've had a very sort of pro, like, like educational, um, you know, uh, ed uh, educating people about the, what biology can do, GMOs, and, and trying to kind of um, change that mindset, and, 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 and also being like very transparent about what we're trying to do, and not hiding anything. Thank you, Austin. Yep. I had to ask the question. Okay, there we go. All right, young lady over here on the end uh, with the blazer. Yes. Hi, I'm Clara. I'm a PG student at Oxford. I had a question towards Dr. Darshil. Uh, you were talking about building materials. Um, and my question is, when looking for biomaterial alternatives to um, materials we're using now, uh, the materials we're using, we're using them for their durability and long-lasting um, um, features. So how, how do you approach that from the biomaterial perspective? Because we know that biomaterials degrade over time and ensuring, for example, that building will, buildings will last is also a part of sustainability. Mm. So how do you approach that problem? I think that's a really good question. Um, I think, well, you're in Cambridge, which is... Uh, a great place to be if you want to look at buildings that have been several hundreds of years old and are made from timber. Uh, and the, I think the answer is related to good design. Uh, and the designer needs to know the limitations of their material and they know, need to know in what applications and in what form they are going to be successful. So I think it's to do with education and therefore design uh, of the structure as well. 
Uh, it's simple as that. There are limitations to lots of materials. If you look at uh, steel, for example, that also has fire-related issues, and we encapsulate it to uh, limit uh, what might happen to it in the case of fire. In fact, if you look at uh, just the dining hall we were in, you saw some timber beams. If you see all of the timber beams are connected by these uh, metal bolts, steel bolts, and on top of the steel bolt, they cover that with timber because steel is a good conductor of heat, uh, and therefore that can lead to the softening of the material and therefore wider scale deformation and quite unpredictable uh, collapse of a building. So I think the answer is, it doesn't mean steel is a bad material, it's a fantastic material and it works quite well with other materials. The other aspect related to design is also considering compatibility and how one material can complement the other. So no a single material is the solution uh, as much as we would like it to be. I think each material has its place. Um, but we need to make a concentrated effort to try and be as renewable and bio-based as possible. Thank you, that's a great question. And since you had your hand up right next to her, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah. Hey, I'm Thelma Gonzalez. I work at a startup where we uh, use bacteria and fungi to biodegrade plastic and try to sell whatever we get as a product. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're working on that. Uh, but coming back to this uh, human part of, you know, being uh, maybe a founder, maybe part of, of a small team that is growing, uh, I can see all of you are highly motivated by long-term ambitions, like, you know, saving the world. But what happens when short-term results are negative or maybe regulation stops you or, or something, uh, some adverse condition hits? Uh, how do you keep motivated to continue changing the world or how do you know how to stop it? And whoever has faced failure. I'm, I'm happy to start <laughs> as a person who's failed many times, and I think that that's part of the experiment, right? Um, so I think the first point you made is how do you stay motivated when you hit a snag, regulatory snag, maybe the results you're hoping for you don't see. Ultimately, you have to be thinking about that North Star and, and remembering that you're essentially running one big experiment, which is made up of many small experiments, right? So. I mean, some of the, the greatest, you know, discoveries in science and in literature. I mean, I don't know why I just thought of J.K. Rowling and napkins and rejections, but I did. So, you know, we, we've got so many examples across industry of, of where you actually grow and learn from. And when, when do you know to stop things? And that's something that we're, we're working on right now at Checker Spot. You have a, just such an opportunity in front of you and so many use cases to explore. There is discipline required and process required in, in starting with pilots, starting small, setting very concrete KPIs, it's my opinion, um, and then having the courage to say, this isn't going to work. You know, it's really easy to get emotionally tied to something, especially when there's been a certain amount of time invested and, and pride invested, but ultimately, like, you can't find your success until you acknowledge your failures. Okay, all right, let's go to this side, right here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Este. Um, I have like a question linked to the previous question that Dr. Austin answered. Um, Christian, you already know it because we talked about it yesterday night, <laughs> but as a professional project, I've been heading towards teach engineering for several years now. Um, and let's say that my dream goal would be to try to create artificial organs. So now maybe that sounds a bit artificial and like in the future, maybe dangerous too. But before even being able to do it, which I'm not even sure I can do it at some point, but I have this ethical question that's in my mind, meaning that as you were saying, Dr. Arstein, we have to, to draw the line at some point. Um, and I just wanted to ask your opinion of each and every one of you, just to see, without thinking about me feeling bad or <laughs> whatever, but uh, would that be a good idea or not, like, morally? Um, I've been running a whole ethical research on that for the whole year. I've drawn some conclusions, but I still have to think about it because I don't think there are final answers for me, at least. And just to finish on that, 
I'm doing this project because I've met several children my age when I was in the United States who had been transplanted and just thinking of like, I mean, interacting with them and having this, these discussions and un understanding that there's a real need for transplants and for artificial organs. But at the same time, I can feel uh, what could happen out of it if, for example, I could change the liver of every person who has had too many drinks. I'm not looking at <laughs> anyone right now, but I mean, this could also um, make your lives longer or make a, a big societal problem. And so that's why if you could just tell me what you think and it would be really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Esther. Hmm. Who wants to kick us off on that one? I feel like much to you. <laughs> I can sure I can start. Um, I think science, science, like the technology, is is mostly neutral, right? Like you, you should you should not like kind of avoid um, the exploring areas because um, I think there's there's a lot of unintended things that that might come out. I think I think where the issues come out is sort of like the applications and sort of like the you know how things are rolled out and. Uh, how you commercialize things, and, and and all those details depend on things that you can't predict up front, right? And and so, if if I, I think we get into trouble if we start killing technologies and projects before we even understand what that what that looks like. Um, so if you're saying like right now, do I think that we should be researching on how to make artificial organs? I think that is we should absolutely be doing that. I just, I just plus one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Estate. Let's go to the back, up there in the corner. Last step, long hair, glasses. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Pavel, I'm a PhD student in London. And I think the past three years have shown that our global international supply chains are incredibly fragile to any kind of macroeconomic events. Granted, you guys don't don't have a magic eight ball, so you can't see in the future. But what kind of things are you possibly doing as you're redefining our use of materials um, to ensure that the new process that you establish is actually resilient to any supply chain disruptions that may or may not come in the future? Okay. Hmm. <laughs> Daniel, <laughs> oh, stumper. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I will say that uh, these last three years, it's been almost exactly, in 2019 is when we signed our agreement with Archer Daniels Midland uh, to partner up and build a multi-hundred million dollar fermentation facility in Iowa. And I think these last three years may have been some of the worst three years in history to build, to have a big construction capital project uh, to try and, and uh, manage just because of the crazy unstable global supply chain, um, you know, fluctuations, instability in commodity prices. Um, like I think Ukraine is one of the biggest suppliers of nickel in the world and nickel is uh, something that needs to be used for making stainless steel and um, a biotech facility uses a lot, an industrial biotech facility uses a lot of stainless steel. Um, copper and in electronics um, has been very challenging. Um, so what do we do? Um, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a good question and it's a tough one to answer. And I will say, you know, we've thought um, through the years that I have been at Spiber, we've thought um, about more kind of like uh, local micro factories, you know, a, a small fermentation facility uh, being right next to, say, a textile mill or um, in, in the locale that it's going to be servicing its polymers or its fibers to. Um, but there's also an element of scale that is necessary if we really want to bring the cost of these materials down to be competitive with petrochemical materials. Um, and there's also the feedstock. You know, not every country has um, a, a bunch of convenient biomass high in sugar content sitting around that we can use as our raw material. Um, so there are some challenges with, with that approach. Um, I, I don't really have a, a good answer for you right now, I guess. But uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's an issue that, that we need to certainly be aware of. Yeah, 
That's a great question. I live in Los Angeles, and um, I think we're the, still the biggest port in the United States. And during the high time of the supply chain backup, I mean, there were hundreds of container ships sitting in the ocean, and it was so dystopian and depressing. So it's an excellent question, and I can't believe we don't have an answer yet. God, I think, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd echo the point about regional bioeconomies. I think yeah. that's really important to generate um, high-skilled jobs as well. Uh, and to use local resources at lower cost, especially when uh, times are strained. But the other aspect we need to think about is also um, policies, because supply chains don't build in a year. They take a lot of time to develop as well. Uh, and if you have certain policies within a country that do not allow or do not encourage the growth of certain materials or uh, supply chains, then you would end up in this situation. So for example, uh, that's been very true with timber in the UK. Uh, with the pandemic, for example, a lot of the timber resources have, we've had lots of time in lockdown, so people have been using it to make their own sheds and for fencing. So the cost, uh, it's been cheaper for large sawmills to just sell it for fencing rather than for building and construction, and therefore construction prices increase by 30% or 40%. And that's because the governments uh, and at the policy level, we haven't done much to ensure that we have a robust uh, long-term strategy around this. And therefore, the, yeah, the resilience aspect is quite key. And then we can go back to, again to um, you know, the electricity aspect. Like now, if you're building a thousand factories in a thousand locations, you know, how do you ensure that you have access to 100% renewable energy in every single one of those locations? Or you have your waste that needs to be disposed of, and what solutions does that locality have to be able to dispose of that waste in a sustainable way? Um, it's hard enough to be managing that for one project, but for thousands, you know, um, that would be that'd be pretty challenging. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe just like one challenge, like we don't know how to do this today, but, but biology is super sustainable. We, like, you know, you can just grow a tree almost anywhere, it'll just grow itself, right? Like, how, how, do, we get, how do we make, how do we, how do we make uh, the, our process, industrial processes more biological, right? How do we replace the tank with something that's biological? How can we just grow, grow our medicines on trees, right? right? Like, why, why do we need the tanks, right? And, and so how do we start replacing um, the processes, taking inspiration from biology, letting stuff, grow itself, um, taking stuff from the soil, from the local environment. Um, you know, that, I, think, I think if we can figure that out, you know, then we will naturally be more sustainable. Yeah, bioengineering you know, a, a feedstock that uh, can grow in a different climate, and then suddenly a country that might not have had access to those kind of, that kind of biomass suddenly can now become a big producer of, uh, of that kind of biological material. So it's definitely an interesting area as well, I think. Gentleman in the back, turtleneck. Hi, I'm Donica from Imbel Heidelberg. Uh, sorry for hogging the mic for two questions today. Maybe I should just bring my own mic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually, speaking of resources of the future, I'm actually of the view that the most important resource hasn't yet been discussed. Um, and that's not actually material or energy, but actually the human labor pool. Mm -hmm. So we're fortunate enough to be living in the great convergence. This will lead to a huge increase in the quantity and quality of um, the human skilled uh, labor pool. Um, what is the, uh, would, so each of you are coming from quite different backgrounds, but what is like the sort of, do you envision any particular sorts of expertise or skills which um, are lacking, which could be of critical importance for the future? Speaking to this entire audience of young people today, I guess. Yeah, we were talking about this as well earlier. Um, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, 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 just amongst ourselves. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, it's not a hard skill if you want to call it, if we want to talk about hard skills or soft skills or whatever. But I don't know if you were here for Bill Anderson's talk yesterday, but he was talking about sort of this, this shift within Roche and v various large companies um, to become essentially more dexterous when it comes to like how do you scale up really quickly, how do you, how do you de dissemble quickly. Um, and that's actually, I think, the most important skill. Somebody who has run large-scale transformations and reorgs and redesigns in my past, I think that the, the most important thing that we can all do in order to maintain our own mental sanity 
and to be able to move as quickly as we need to with the scale of discovery now is to be flexible and to be able to adapt and be willing to adapt and keep curious. I mean, so it's, it's not, you know, yes, we need to be investing more now in sciences. Of course, that's why we're here. That's why you're here. But I'm never really worried when I'm looking to hire for looking for brilliant people. You know, there are many brilliant people out there. But it's the people who can come, who I know will be collaborative in the approach to find, like, how do we move more quickly? How do we... Um, you know, I, you know, we're going to shut down that project because it's not working. So let's take this, let's learn from it, and let's start it here really quickly. Like that sort of tenacity is actually the most important exercise or muscle to exercise, I think now. And I, I would say, like the 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 bioeconomy needs to be much bigger than it is today, and and it's not going to come from investments from big companies or governments. It's going to come from small companies. It can come from um, new companies. I think the mind shift is needs to change and sort of like scientists turn entrepreneurs. Like it's not, like in the tech industry, it, it, it's, you know, there's, there's left and right, you have companies being formed and, 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 and shutting down. It's, it's a lot less, you see a lot less in, in sort of biotech. And I think getting that um, mental shift that it's okay to try things, that uh, making it cheaper for that experiment to, you know, and it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's going to be extremely important. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, I think if I can add to that Please. very quickly is another skill is to do with creativity. We know that over the next decades, automation is going to really kick in as well. So we need uh, very high skilled jobs and that will help hopefully also democratize the workforce much more as well. The problem currently is we tend to throw materials at problems mm -hmm. to solve the situation, whereas uh, currently labor is expensive and materials are cheap, therefore we keep checking materials at something to solve the problem. But therefore we need to actually spend more time thinking creatively around problems to present more sustainable solutions. So for example, one of my favorite buildings is the Termulum building in, in Rotterdam. It used to be a derelict uh, two then four story shopping center and it was over designed and that's very common in engineering think buildings airplanes they're all over designed by significant <coughs> ma margins of error uh, and they constructed uh, a 14 story timber building on top of the existing building without changing any of the foundations so that's something you can do by being creative and in the future we will be demolishing much less hopefully and retrofitting more buildings and therefore it does require creativity to present that solution as palatable to the public who will be buying homes or buy, uh, yeah, buying a workspace or whatever it is. Yep. All types of brains and perspectives to make something like that happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we are getting close to time, so I want to get as much questions in as possible. Over here, uh, long hair, gray blazer. Tomayor from Cornell. Um, so I wanted to ask a question that hasn't been asked. So most people here may come from first world countries, but we also come like from a variety of developing countries where like everything is different, like from the US. So I just wanted you guys to forget for like one minute that you are from a first world country. And then how will you like approach the fact that in countries like Ecuador, there is not like laws that support like synthetic biology. Like how, if you were in that position, how will you deal with that? Excellent question, Mayden. That's a really good question. I have a, I was about to get on a soapbox, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I answered the last one, I think, so. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Room for everybody. <laughs> well. As I'm, I'm being such the woman on the panel right Listen, now. Listen, like, okay. there's only two of us, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, that is such a great question. And what I, you know, the reason that we are where we are in the US now is because there became the point of necessity in order to like have policy sort of create the structure around motivating us to be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about your question, I think about my old life in politics and I think this is actually where you, you need to come in and say, what are the needs, what are the challenges facing society in Ecuador right now? And how do we create policies that are going to support 
a problem or solving solving that problem with a solution that's going to be sustainable. And, it, and you know, at some point, like we need policy because change management is difficult. Human nature is pretty ingrained. Like that's just the way we are. <laughs> you know, until there was a bag tax in the U.S. I mean, I mean, I use plastic bags, right? Like it's we need motivation. So it's figuring out what is it that's actually happening and going in to use the creativity and the, the tool you have at your disposal, which is policy change, and, and creating policies to help solve a problem that are actually gonna make people's lives better, and that's where you actually start to see traction. I was, uh, I was gonna chime in with something pretty anecdotal because <clears throat> Spiber's first commercial fermentation plant is actually in Thailand, and um, we originally chose Thailand because um, it has such excellent, you know, sugarcane biomass resources that we can use as our feedstock. It had um, pretty stable infrastructure, so you could rely on the fact that we're going to be able to constantly get water. We're going to be able to constantly get electricity without a lot of blackouts. Um, uh, and and then I would just echo the policy uh, statement as well because um, that was really what clinched the deal for us was that the Thailand government is very much focused on the bioeconomy right now. They know that they have something good with all of their biomass and resources in the country, and they want to leverage that, and they want to bring in uh, external investment, and they also want to grow um, the bioeconomy community uh, locally in Thailand. So they're investing into universities, um, they have incentives for companies like us to come to Thailand, um, although we didn't end up using it because uh, they kept changing their minds about what the rules were going to be until the last minute, and uh, we couldn't agree on anything. <laughs> but um, the the uh, the thought, the intention is there, and I think that's um, really what uh, countries, uh, you know, developing countries need to be focused on is identifying those opportunities and then. Um, putting policies into place that are going to support growth in those, in those areas. Um, I think Thailand has been pretty successful with that, and uh, I think uh, we're going to be seeing that elsewhere as well. That's a great question. Thank you. My mother's from El Salvador, and I totally understand where that question's from, so thank you. Who's next? Nobody on this side. Back there, all the way in the back. Thank you, this has been really exciting. My name is Sasha, I'm a PG student here in Cambridge. So my question is quite general, which is, um, in my opinion, you've touched on that biology as a technology, its main advantage is the diversity it offers. But so far we've seen that any type of resource we've been using, once we start scaling up the usage of this resource, we go towards really depleting this diversity. It's both in biology and other resources as well. How do we really go about, like, are we intentional about maintaining this diversity in the beginning of our practices? And what is, what should we do in your respective industries to keep investing in this diversity um, while scaling up? Thanks. Is that diversity like biodiversity? <laughs> and those of you in the back really like to stump these guys, don't you? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> excellent response. <laughs> Well, I'm, I guess I'm not sure how important uh, it is necessarily from the perspective of our, of our process that our raw material needs to be diverse. Um, but it is important, and maybe what you, maybe your intention in, in that question is, you know, when we scale up any raw material, once you get to a scale that is massive enough, it starts to cause problems um, because you're using too much of it. And that could certainly be said for our raw materials. You know, if you take corn, for example, in the U.S., I think I was calculating this the other day, but if we wanted to um, replace the entire polyester fiber market with our protein materials, we would need to use more 
um, corn than currently exists in the world today, for sure. Um, <coughs> both the corn that's being grown not to be eaten and the crown, corn that is also being grown to be eaten. Um, so that would definitely cause a problem um, if, uh, if we grow to that scale and we still don't have any alternatives to corn. Um, I don't think, um, you know, one answer it could be diversity of raw materials, having a lot of different options that you can choose from, so you're not causing too large of a burden on any, given, on any one of those. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, I don't think. Um, for example, um, there are fermentation technologies these days uh, that use CO2 uh, as, their, as their feedstock. CO2, sunlight, and um, voila, you, you can get a product out of that. And so, you know, um, I'm not sure if, uh, I, I don't know what the yields are of those fermentation processes, um, but I would imagine that there's probably um, all, enough CO2 in the world that we would be more than happy to, to use that for even, you know, very massive scale uh, fermentation solutions. But, um, yeah, I, in the short term, well, CO2, I think, is not necessarily super long term because there are people already being successful using it uh, at scale. But um, we are definitely going to need to be uh, investing more. And, and there's a lot of investment already going into alternative feedstocks um, for processes like ourselves. Um, and I do think, yeah, that's, that's a very valuable endeavor. Yeah, I think adding to that, uh, diversification of uh, resources is quite critical, bioresources. But also adding that uh, wood is a model material in that uh, respect. We, Wood is the third most used material in general, and the amount, the volume we've been using has been fairly constant at 3.6 billion uh, meter cube for about 30 odd years. And the forest area, if you look at Europe, especially where you use sustainable forest management practices, has grown by the size of Portugal in Europe over the past 30 years. So you can do things sustainably and ensure increased biodiversity. I think it is partly to do with implementing those sustainable forage, forest management practices and also thinking about um, what sort of forest resources you want to block off as being completely virgin and untouched, so as primary forests which are completely protected, and then you have a certain sector of forests that might be plantations. So for example, currently I think 8% of global forests are planted, they're plantations, but we get about 40% of wood resources from them. Mm -hmm. But you still need to avoid uh, challenges with monocultures, for example, because you want to promote biodiversity for the 40-year duration while that plantation is growing. So I think there are good practices out there which we can learn from. Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to squeeze in one more question, and then if it's okay that I offer up all of your time after this for them to come down and ask you questions, is that okay? okay. All right, so one more audience question, and then we'll close up. Sir. Hi. Yes, so uh, I'm Emil. Uh, I've also been asking questions today. Um, so I just, um, I'm, I'm quite a pessimistic person by nature. I don't know if it's my, like, Danish genes or something, <laughs> but... Um, so, I think uh, I would like maybe for you guys to um, answer just like one question that is either have you experienced a problem that you didn't think was possible to solve in the last decade with biotechnology um, or a problem in the future, near future, that you think uh, we can solve um, with biotechnology? <coughs> Um, and maybe just like one answer each. <laughs> um, He's the new moderator, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. we'll start with you, Daniel. Could we not start with me? <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. Austin, we'll start with you. So I think, I think biology is uniquely suited to certain problems that can't be solved otherwise. Um, and and I, I think, you know, like what's, unique about biology is it operates on the atomic scale, but it can also operate on the global scale. And so for me, you know, things like climate change, things that are like on a global planetary scale, I think biology is like the, pretty much the only, like it has to be part of the solution. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to see what, what how, how we can uh, address those with biology. I'm gonna come over here, Darshiel. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I think one of the challenges we have faced is to do with public perception with materials. I think you raised the point of durability of uh, biomaterials earlier, uh, and there are similar apprehensions relating to cost or viability, sometimes by lobbying bodies as well. Uh, and that is something we continue to work with uh, and towards through education and evidence. Uh, that's what's key, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel, you ready? I am ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually going to kind of throw back to some, something we'd been discussing earlier. We talked about biodegradability. How do you balance wanting to have something that lasts a long time versus wanting to have something that doesn't last a long time? I mean, they're fundamentally um, in op opposition to each other. Um, and we also talked about how biology has to be part of the solution, but um, that doesn't mean that, there, that it works all on its own. You know, if we think about materials, and we also talked about the wooden beams having the steel, uh, the steel nails and then being covered by wood. And um, so that brings us to an issue that Spiber is quite focused on right now, um, which we are calling biosphere, the biosphere circulation. So you oftentimes need to have materials working together in a mix. Um, but if some of them are natural and some of them are petrochemical, um, unless you can separate those at the end of life, you're not going to be able to, you know, throw your biological materials away to biodegrade and then recycle your petrochemical materials. So um, I think uh, policy and also industry working together to make standards going in, into the future for materials to make sure that when we are mixing things together, when we are using biology as part of a solution, um, making sure that things are made in such a way that um, we can separate them and then deal with them each in the way that they need to be dealt with at the end of life um, is an, an issue. So I guess that was kind of like a problem that biology can't necessarily solve uh, by itself. And then we'll wrap up with Kinley with one last question from us and then we'll be done. Oh. Yeah, for me, the thing that gets me up in the morning um, a lot right now is the opportunity that we will be exploring the next few years, which is drastically decreasing infant mortality in developing countries. Um, you know, the, there's a real opportunity there, and luckily we think that there's a, a very strong, solid solution. Um, and so yes, a lot of that is, it is, you know, it's biology, but it's also partnering with distributors, it's figuring out how to do something that's sustainable, it's accessible and affordable. Um, but that is, that is bringing me a lot of joy right now. So um, this is how I'd like to wrap us up. You all have had a chance to hear these wonderful questions, meet some of these brilliant kids. Um, a lot of you are in positions to hire and thinking about future workforce development. So I'm curious, after being here, can you each tell me what you're most excited about in terms of future you know, workforce and, and what's to come around the innovation you're working on and the innovation these young people will bring? Yeah, if I, if I can start, yeah, I think uh, it's the multidisciplinarity aspect of it and how we can get people from very different skill sets to come together to provide solutions that one person wouldn't have been able to come up with. And at the center, we work with biochemists who look at genetically modified plants. We look at, we work with chemists who look at uh, polymerization of ancient archaeological timbers for durability. We work with uh, engineers and structural engineers for uh, the design of uh, tall timber skyscrapers. And these are all problems. Uh, we are asking questions that we don't have answers to, but hopefully over the 10, next 10, 15 years, we may have answers to. So I think it's the multidisciplinarity skill set that we are really interested and excited about. Yeah, thank you, Darshiel. McKinley. Uh, early in my career, I was taught to always hire people who are smarter than you, and you should be a little bit intimidated when you interview them, and I am frankly very hopeful that that will be the case, meeting all of you. Um, very, very smart, and um, I know that working with any of you, I'd feel, I wouldn't feel like the smartest person in the room, and that's, that's how you improve. So By the way, she wasn't at the talk yesterday, so oh. she, no, we, we talked about that a lot. Oh. Yeah, so thank you. Austin. 
I'd rather not hire any of you. I, I would rather you guys all go start companies and you know we can partner with you. <laughs> yeah. For me, that's that that would be much more exciting, much much uh, more productive. And you know, sort of our goal is to enable new companies to come into existence. And we want the brightest minds. You know, we love to hire bright minds, but I want the brightest minds to go out and start start their own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I often see people talking about uh, a generational shift towards more mission-driven, experience-driven, uh, or, or mission-motivated uh, workforce. And I think that's very exciting for uh, synthetic biology or the, the biology industry because it's pretty easy to uh, you know, care about uh, the mission because um, it's, it's there, it's clear, um, it's, it's strong. Um, and I also wanted to echo the, uh, the multidisciplinary um, comment because that's something I've felt very keenly as well. As society gets more and more complex, people tend to become more and more specialized in something very specific. And I think um, that is necessary and good in some aspects, but uh, we're also losing something by uh, not having people um, that are more of a generalist or more interdisciplinary. Um, and so I think promoting uh, those kinds of initiatives uh, in education uh, will uh, definitely help create a workforce um, that will be filling uh, a gap again um, that, that we're needing to fill in, in the industry. Thank you, there's a bright red screen, negative five <laughs> minutes coming at us right now. So thank you, big round of applause to our panelists and to you for these great questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to our panel today and for all the panels that we have had in the past. I think they have given us a lot of answers. It has also led to a lot of uh, unanswered questions, new questions that we have. So I hope you all have something to take away from it. Uh, we are immediately jumping into the keynote speaker. So we will have a two minute break while we uh, take care of the AV requirements. And if you have any questions later on, you can reach out to them. But thank you.